Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Yourself Healthy podcast. I'm your host, Heather Duranja. Let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody. On today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy, we have special guest, Jessica McGuire. (laughs) Jessica treated patients as a physiotherapist for over 13 years. Her passion for health led to a degree in health science, and she then went on to complete a master's of physiotherapy. Her specialty now is teaching on the vagus nerve and nervous system through the vagus nerve masterclass program and workshops. They demonstrate how stress-related illness, such as anxiety, depression, gut disorders, autoimmune issues, and chronic pain can rise from dysregulation after chronic or traumatic stress. Well, Jess, I am so excited to have you here today to talk about this. This is one of my absolute favorite topics. As a registered dietitian, you know, when it comes to digestion and understanding how the nervous system plays a role in how trauma contributes to our nervous system regulation, um, it really makes a lot of sense why so many individuals are suffering with digestive distress and autoimmune disease. So I'm really excited to have an opportunity today to chat with you and dive deeper into this very, very important concept that needs to be addressed. And unfortunately, in our Western medicine, it's not something that is even more often than less even discussed by your doctor. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. I'm really excited to be here. I am so excited. So I'm just going to share a little story with you, and then we're going to dive into this concept. Okay. As a young girl, I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional home environment. There was lots and lots of chaos. And whenever it was time to eat meals, I would always have no appetite. When I did try to eat, I would have lots and lots of pains in my stomach and So I would complain to my mom and dad and they would take me to the doctor. And then the doctor would say, we can't find anything wrong with her. It's all in her head. And so at about 11 years old, they started medicating me for depression and anxiety because it was in my head. I wasn't really having these issues. So for me, this is where number one, I learned to not trust authority figures. And secondly, I no longer could trust myself because I was being gaslit about the real symptoms that I was experiencing. I was confused. I didn't know what was real and what was not real. So talk to me a little bit about this. Is this something you see that's pretty common? Yes. Well, I think gut pain is very common now for sure for so many people and definitely that link with stress. And I would say there's a high proportion of people that that turn up to, to seek medical help and have pain, but there's no explanation for what's going on. Um, and we can certainly understand this from looking at anxiety and the way it changes gut motility so closely and that connection from the brain via the vagus nerve down to the gut so that, you know, if there is anxiety, blood will move away. It saddens me to hear that people are told that it's all in their head. Um, Working as a physiotherapist, the message also was told to patients. So it's still going on a little bit, although I have a lot more faith now in modern pain science of what we're seeing coming through and that, that paradigm that we can't, separate the brain and the body or what we might look at as things that influence us can be top down from our brain down to our body bottom up so we know now the gut isn't impacting on the brain but also really importantly outside in so our relationships people around us what's going on so yes it is something that we certainly see a lot of and I certainly saw that with um patients who had persistent pain Mm -hmm. I think there is a there's a percentage of people that don't improve with you know normal treatments like manual therapy um, stretching those sorts of things and those people are let down by the medical system 
Mm -hmm. Because we say, well, if I'm using these modalities and you're not getting better, there must be something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something I saw with chronic lower back pain and the messaging we were sending to patients that I was really disappointed by. I was seeing that people weren't getting better. They were falling through the cracks. They were it was harder for them to work, to support themselves. They were really suffering. And we were sending messages that is, "Mm, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. So thankfully that's changing. Yeah. I think, I think this is actually a really big conversation that can be had around pain and the way that our systems tend to approach it. I I myself specialize working with individuals whom are in mental health and substance abuse recovery. And so more often than less, what I hear patients say over and over and over again is it started with an injury. I had an injury, the injury led to pain. They put me on these medications to manage the pain. And then they became addicted. And so we have a significant opiate crisis. You know, this is beyond just the US. It's really worldwide. It's not isolated just to the US, but it's a massive, massive problem in the United States. And this seems to be the only solution is for for pain management is, you know, with the use of, of pharmaceutical medications. So for myself, I really try to make it more of an educational conversation around a man, you know, managing inflammation to help reduce the pain. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to the audience a little bit about what are other options outside of pharmacological agents to manage pain? What are the contributors and how the nervous system is playing a role in all of that messaging that contributes to the significance of their pain response? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. As I mentioned before, that model where we look at top down, bottom up, outside in, or what is a really nice model, model to use is to understand looking through this lens of bio, biopsychosocial factors. So it's a very long, clunky word, but it basically is inviting us when things are chronic and persistent, and we know they're not getting better with short conventional treatments. This is when it's chronic. And this can be whether this is somebody experiencing physical pain or emotional pain. We need to look at all those factors. Mm -hmm. So yes, biologically, there may have been an injury, there may be inflammation, genetic components, that sort of thing. But really to look also at those top-down factors or the psychological factors. So a study showed that with chronic lower back pain that wasn't getting better, the number one factor that determined the time it took for somebody to get better was the belief they had around what was wrong with them. So that's way more powerful than what's going on necessarily from a tissue point of view. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about here is when the tissue gets better or is past that healing time, but the pain persists. And this is why I love education so much too, Heather, is that it helps us to see things like tissue, well, pain doesn't always equal tissue damage. Mm -hmm. So we can have... Of course, we touch something hot, we'll pull away, we'll feel the pain before there might be damage. So when we look at helping people getting out of this trap of pain, we need to look at what are we believing about it? And where did that belief come from? So imaging, when we take MRIs and look at things, can be really useful for some conditions but for some things, it's not so helpful and can actually increase fear. So when there's fear, that will increase pain because it's going to produce a greater pain response or light up more areas in the brain. Mm -hmm. So our old medical model that separated the brain and body, it didn't really help us because we only looked at the tissue to be the Mm -hmm. source of the problem. But what we're seeing now is that we can have an amplification of the signals being sent up to the brain. We can have more areas in the brain lighting up than it should. So to really look at, okay, where did this belief come from? 
what's the language I'm using around what's what's happening? So, for example, a slipped disc for a lot of people gives this image that the disc in the lower back is just going to slide out and go somewhere. But we know that they're very stable. So those kind of things can drive fear. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we can really look at what is happening around us outside as well. So what are our relationships like? We know that connection helps the immune system. It reduces inflammation, good relationships. So that stuff can be helpful too. And then we can look at how over time we can increase our capacity to do things like walking or extra exercise or things like that where we may have been, um, that may have been diminished. And this is true also in terms of um, stress. You know, we, we are going to experience stress if we live in this human body. That's not a bad thing. You know, that's okay. But how we can get better at in the heat of the moment, not shooting on up into fight or flight, down into shutdown, and also that we get learn to help ourselves recover from stressful events, come back to the present moment or back to a regulated nervous system as well. Mm-hmm. And that's a challenge, right, for most individuals. One thing that I, I find often is that most individuals whom are suffering some, some sort of chronic situation, whether it be chronic pain or an autoimmune disease, that part of the root is the attachment to this diagnosis and that this diagnosis is really serving a purpose. It may not be the purpose that they intend to serve, but it is serving a purpose. Do you feel comfortable talking a little bit more about that and kind of helping explain to the audience what, how this process is associated with subconscious belief systems and how it impacts the nervous system? Sure. This is a really interesting topic. I think it takes some reflection and to slow down and see what thoughts are happening beneath our awareness because often we're not quite they they create a flavor of thoughts but it's coming from something underneath that that we can't see Uh, what's been interesting is to see that for a finger say a violinist a person who plays a violin has a finger injury it will be much higher the pain that they experience than somebody who for example is a dancer Mm -hmm. and what we see is that's linked to their identity Mm. the threat to their work um, and the fear that, oh my gosh, my income could be jeopardized. So we know that when we look at things, context matters. So no two people will experience the same pain. And in looking at if, say, for instance, stress goes on to become um, traumatic stress, what we see is that a person's history matters if they've experienced something like that before their culture their genetics it's going to be different for everybody Mm -hmm. so what might be considered traumatic to me might not be that way for you but once we receive a label or a diagnosis that has meaning that's linked to our identity Um, one of the biggest ones that we might see is things like osteoarthritis And so when people have that, oh, I can't do anything with this knee, this old knee, I've got osteoarthritis, it's like an old rusty hinge. So the things we say, the labels we use are going to be driving that response. And even the language that we speak about ourselves with, like, you know, we can see people cut off from a part of their body, like, oh, this old shoulder, come on, let's bring it. It's going to change the way that we carry ourselves, the way that we move, our energy, how we feel about ourselves. And sometimes there's a lot that can come from even our parents. You know, my mum had this really bad back pain. Auntie Jo ended up in a wheelchair. You know, this is just in my genetics. This is my family. So it's important to look at, well, is that really true? Mm -hmm. And to see if we're just making these assumptions or absorbing these beliefs because they will change our physiology in a big, big way. But 
certainly looking at, I think it's useful to look at, like we said, what am I believing, first mm-hmm. of all, is happening? Is that true? Where did this belief come from? And does it have a purpose or what's the function of it? Mm-hmm. So sometimes we may have received a diagnosis from a health professional um, and technically if it's, you know, if we look back at what imaging is showing, like I said, with the osteoarthritis, for example, that's no different than having a wrinkle or a grey hair. Mm-hmm. We're all going to have some age-related changes as we get older. But do the words degenerative disc disease make you feel a little bit, ooh, because it certainly would me if I received that as a diagnosis rather than these are normal age-related changes. Mm -hmm. So I think looking at how, like the language as health professionals and what's being used and how our paradigms are now changing to say that, you know, we can take imaging of a huge population of their lower back and 50% Mm -hmm. of them will have bulging discs and no pain. So what what we're sort of looking at now is some imaging isn't actually useful to help us as clinicians. And it can just make people fearful. It can bring a label that is, I'm broken. Mm -hmm. So it is important for health professionals, number one, to be aware of their language and what they're teaching, but also number two, for all of us to have that education or learning about what would be true with modern pain science. Mm-hmm. rather than accepting a diagnosis and saying, this is me, this is who I am. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And this is something that is very near and dear to my heart because at the age of 18, I got diagnosed with a chronic autoimmune kidney disease. And I was told that I had a prognosis of five years to live and, or mm-hmm. I would be on dialysis or transplant. And for me at that time, I was unable to get health insurance. So this was really a blessing in disguise. There was something intuitive within me that said, I can't accept that as my diagnosis and fate. And it allowed for me to seek information outside of our Western practices. And I discovered holistic lifestyle habits that contributed significantly to the quality of life and ultimately the prognosis of my kidney disease. And so I'm happy to report that it's been 27 years since that diagnosis, and I've had no medical interventions needed Mm -hmm. up to this point which is really great, but that really, um, opened my eyes to how, how much trust we basically, how much power we put into the hands of our practitioners Mm -hmm. and that these diagnoses, you know, typically, especially in Western medicine, when you get a diagnosis, they tend to go to the very extreme of what the possibilities are because of liability factors, right? They don't want to get sued. So they want to make sure they put the worst case scenario out there to ensure that, you know, you understand where this could go. But most people just attach to this diagnosis and then literally manifest those circumstances into their lives. I had a um, client who came to me when I want to say she was maybe 60, 61. She was diagnosed with MS at the age of 25. And as a result of that, she literally made life choices based off of this diagnosis based on what the prognosis was supposed to yield. So at 61, she comes to me and she tells me, I can't even stand without having assistance for more than two minutes at a time. She was almost to the point where she was going to have to be wheelchair bound. And so as we started making changes with her lifestyle habits and really working on the mindset around the diagnosis within one year, one year, she joined me on a five mile hike that was supposed to be like easy level. And I was like shocked when we get there and it was not easy. It was like uphill and rocky and all of this stuff. And she was so proud of herself. And then recently she had emailed me, letting me know that 
weekly, she rides her bike over 50 miles at a time. And she's like, you know, Heather, it's amazing at 63, 64 years old. I never imagined that I would be living more life than I did at the age of 25. So anything is possible if we choose to give ourselves permission to think beyond just that diagnosis and prognosis. So talk to me and tell me or tell the audience, what are some of the amazing things that you've experienced as a practitioner with individuals being able to overcome these diagnoses and prognoses based on approaching it from a mindset and language perspective? Sure. So I would look at this mostly as people who were experiencing the the chronic pain that had been disabling. Mm -hmm. So it might be, say, a woman who has a really stressful time because she needs to move house and move to a new town, find a new job. And let's say, for example, she is packing up her house and the repetitive bending forwards, she gets um, a, a sprain to her lower back or a strain to her lower back. And then she has a lot of fear around this. She may have a lack of support. And over time, it drives up and ramps up and ramps up. Now, she's not sleeping. She's really worried about her job and if she'll be able to start. And let's say she's a single mother, so there's not help around. Mm -hmm. And over months and months of experiencing very distressing symptoms and she's anxious and she's not sleeping, she may try these treatments but it's like putting a band-aid on the outside because it's not getting to what's really driving it which she thinks her back is broken Mm -hmm. so that's the fear the oh my god my back is just never going to get better it's going to be like this forever I'll I'll go broke I won't be able to support my family and so once we can explain to people that your back's not broken, it's very sensitized. Now, there are some cases where people get significant injuries, Mm -hmm. you know, that 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 are not going to respond to um uh language like this, you know, like they may need rest if we were to say somebody fractured a vertebrae, you know, that Mm -hmm. would be highly painful. Um, but that's a that's a small minority of cases. Uh once somebody has the belief, okay, my back's not broken, then the movement patterns will change. So let's say they're just so tensed up and so wound up that laying on their back, they don't even want to bring their knees in towards their chest. So once that happens, then the nervous system allows things just to come down a bit and then they can move and then they can start to bend forward which is something that people often avoid when they have lower back pain but being able to return to work being able to be a parent sleep all those things are huge but a lot of the time it's getting to what's the belief Mm -hmm. um, for those chronic things that like specifically things where we know it's not necessarily a in the case of the, of the lower back, it's not necessarily something that's sinister because, of mm-hmm. course, we still need to get that examined and that's not what we'd say is to ignore it or not, you know, not get health a, a, a proper assessment. Right. But when it's going and, as we said, it, it, it ties in with beliefs and identity and all those things. So when someone can see, okay, I'm not broken, it's not going to be like this forever, then there's an immediate sense of, oh, okay, then sleep can improve, then exercise can start again. So for this woman, she could start going out for walks and then she connected with people in her area. So it has this ongoing, beautiful flow and effect in so many facets of somebody's life. But without that belief changing, where would that woman be in a few years' time? Mm-hmm. It could very easily go in a downward spiral. So yeah. not going back to work. And that's a, a lot of people don't go back to work. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they believe that, that their back is broken. There's, if there's conflict at work, if they've got an unsupportive employer who says it's all in your head, like we were saying, you know, all of those things can create 
a cycle that could go one way or the other that could last a long time. Yeah. So I do think there's a lot of power in like for health professionals, if that's who's listening, being able to use language that it's by no means sugarcoating anything, but it's certainly looking at it in a way that this is what the evidence shows. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, I'm going to interrupt this episode for a really brief message and to introduce you to today's amazing podcast sponsors, Waveblock. If you know me, you know that I am all about reducing toxicity. And to be perfectly honest with you, this whole 5G thing has got me a little freaked out. Did you know that your phone and AirPods emit radiation? According to the CDC, your phone uses radio frequency radiation to transmit its signal. This cloud of radiation just sits outside your brain the entire time you're using your phone or on your AirPods. If you listen to podcasts, talk on your phone, do Zoom calls all day, that exposure really starts to add up. The frequencies from your phone actually pass through your brain, which is really scary and can cause negative effects like headaches, foggy brain, fatigue, and other issues. I love using my WaveBlock EMF protective stickers for my phone and AirPods to direct these harmful frequencies away from my body and my brain. WaveBlock's accredited lab-tested line of products help significantly reduce the amount of radiation you are getting exposed to with their easy-to-apply EMF blocking stickers. They have protection for AirPods, AirPod Pros, and all of the recent iPhone models. These stickers don't interfere with anything, so you can still use your phone case or whatever it is that you like. They just offer all day protection. Make sure you head to waveblock.com and take advantage of a 20% discount using the code Heather. I'll make sure to link it in the show notes for easy access. So make sure you head to waveblock.com to get your 20% off discount and use the code Heather. And this yeah. is what is likely to, you know, be the outcome. But I know it's like that prognosis of something scary and then you've only got to start Googling your symptoms and you think that you've got cancer and all sorts of things. So it's it's it can be very scary. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it definitely, you know, makes me think about how when we do have these chronic pains and we are managing chronic, either we get the surgery, like let's say we go, the she goes and gets the surgery, the lower back surgery, and then is still managing the discomfort post-surgery with medication. And then the goal is to wean off that medication, but there's a lot of fear that's associated with reducing and tapering off these medications. And then they find themselves right back where they began initially. And they say the surgery didn't work. Now I'm going to have to be on these pills, you know, the rest of my life. So how do we get out of that vicious cycle? How, how, what is one piece of advice that you could give the listener who is potentially in stuck in that cycle right now? I'm thinking of one very specific person. So okay. what kind of advice do you have for that individual mm -hmm. whom went through the surgery, is managing with the medication right now and having fear around getting off the medication that ultimately she's going to discover the surgery didn't work. Hmm. So what is useful to look at is sometimes with surgery, it doesn't change the sensitivity in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's helpful to have skills where we can bring some regulation to that as we spoke about before, but really looking at unpacking those fears. Mm -hmm. um, and this can be really helpful to work with a health professional who can take us through looking at what our beliefs are and can also give an education sense that doesn't lead to catastrophizing mm -hmm. or thinking that things are going to be awful. But really the thing that, I love to see people grasp is the concept of pacing. So we say that we have our old tissue provocation line, which is mm -hmm. say we've got a big tolerance. And let's say after an injury that's chronic or after something happens and it, and, it, and it becomes chronic, like say the woman that I was just explaining, the tissue tolerance line might come down a bit. Mm -hmm. But what we want to be able to do is expand that up 
quite, you know, slowly, but we can come up to a line if we drew underneath that, that might be our flare up line. Mm -hmm. And we learn to stop just before that. So we don't want to push ourselves to be overdoing and then we push through the pain and then we crash and burn. So some people are a little bit overdoers, but mm -hmm. we also don't want to be so scared that we start to avoid things where we under function and then we're never actually increasing our capacity. So this concept of pacing means that we might work out, okay, how long can I walk for? Mm -hmm. Can I walk for 20 minutes? Mm, no, that's going to be true sore the next day. What about 10? Not quite sure. All right, well, maybe I'll start at five minutes and look at that and then just increase each week a little bit. But even though we've got pain, we may have some pain at the time of doing it, learning to say, understand modern pain science to know that that could be the protective part of the nervous system coming in, but it doesn't necessarily mean tissue damage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so th th this can be helpful to work with someone. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sitting here thinking, you know, we are an instant gratification society, right? We have unrealistic expectations. So for most individuals, they want the 20 minutes right away because otherwise starting at five feels like they're, they're not doing anything. So how do we train, how, what kind of advice can you give the individual on maybe having a little more compassion and grace towards self to lower that expectation, to have the ability to approach the pacing perspective? Mm. I, I think it's looking at for the long term what we see with the boom and bust approach where someone's like pushing through then they collapse for a few days is that overall they're doing less activity than if they just did shorter amounts each day mm -hmm. and so that capacity goes down but it's it's definitely a personality type so for those who are overachievers the perfectionists they're going to want to push that and I think just being aware but also having someone that we can bounce that conversation back and forth because I think it's hard to be objective with yourself yeah. whether it's you know anyone I mean some of us will go to the gym and have these huge expectations to train for two hours and then we beat ourselves up for only doing 45 minutes when really 45 minutes is great so I think having sometimes having somebody else tell us how much to do can be helpful mm -hmm. but also to understand for the people that are avoiding it that looking into the reasons why so I definitely used to see it with people who hurt their back and they were like I'm never going to bend forward again because that always means it hurts and then so it's like walking around with a clenched fist and trying to move that way but if the person just relaxed you know that's that's often improved but these beliefs can come from when we we see I don't know if you ever remember those <laughs> models that with, they used to be lower back spine models and there'd be the little discs in between that look like collagen-y type stuff. And then they'd have this red thing in them that looked like that's pain, that's scary. And the I remember that before the language used to be, so when you bend forward, the disc can just pop out the back. I mean, how scary is that for somebody? But it Absolutely. doesn't even resemble, you know, how it is, what... We know they're very solid structures and they're not like this jelly type thing. They're very solid and those models were only made to show where the disc was, but it's not actually a reflection. But if I'm picturing that in my mind every time I bend forwards, that is going to make me brace. It's going to make me hold my breath. It's going to increase anxiety. So that's what we've really got to help people with as health professionals. But also if you are in that situation and, you know, maybe there is a diagnosis of something that limits you, totally understand that. But looking where if, we're, if we know the tissue or we know the pain or we know that, say, with something like MS, which is very interesting because we have cycles with MS where we can regress, so we can do more. It's, it's learning that 
how, what, yeah, all those factors of what we're believing, what we're thinking about it will be influencing it in a big mm -hmm. way. And I think understanding for ourselves, are we an over-functioner or an under-functioner? Because mm -hmm. that can be with stress too, right? Like some people who get stress, they tend to be like, I need to do everything quick. I can't sit still. And some people get stressed and they just lay on the couch and like, I can't do anything. I feel so flat. So learning that about ourselves is really useful. Yeah, absolutely. And you're bringing awareness to myself on some of the stories and beliefs that I have within my own physical body around movement. Um, I have a lot of resistance with practicing more um, regularly in terms of stretching and yoga type of activities. And it's because I'm constantly telling myself and have told myself a story since early childhood when I had a PE teacher tell me I wasn't limber that, oh, mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, I, I'm not flexible. I'm not flexible. It's hard for me. I can't do it. So this is definitely bringing some awareness around the language that I'm using with myself and the resistance that I'm having to getting back into a more normalized practice. So I appreciate, I appreciate the conversation. <laughs> That is such a good example, actually, the, the, um, the coaching one around, you know, there's lots of coaches who would say things like, you just need to harden up or like, you know, you're not flexible, mm -hmm. you're not this, you're not that. And kids' brains, I mean, yeah. it'll yeah. go in and it will stay there. I love that. And that kind of wants me, I want to segue to this topic that I'm just dying to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. And it's associated with how our nervous system regulation as a child affects how we, um, you know, cope with stress as an adult. And mm -hmm. I am 100% convinced that as a child, my nervous system response was trained in the womb based off of what was going on in my mother's life the neurochemicals and hormones that she was releasing and how that programmed my own baseline state of survival. So is this something that you're open to talking about? I would love to. This is one of my favorite topics. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, it's useful to look at the vagus nerve in understanding this. And it's the vagus nerve isn't one nerve, it's many connections, but one of the most important one for our for regulating our nervous system is the part of the vagus nerve called the vagal break. So it's running from the brain stem down to the sinoatrial node of the heart, which is just a fancy word for the pacemaker. Okay. And that is it's more recently evolved. So that allowed us as humans to slow ourselves down and to connect, work together, work collaboratively. Um, and those who cooperated were the ones who survived. So we switched from that very fight flight response into working together. So this branch is forming still when we are in utero, particularly what it is, is, is the myelin, which you would understand working with people with MS, but for anyone who doesn't know, it's just the coating around the nerve. So that's forming when we're in the womb and most of it through to our younger years, you know, the first few years, but there's science to show that it goes, its formation happens through to our teenage years. And the way that it really forms is through our social bonds. So our connections with our caregivers. And we don't have a capacity for self-regulation early in life. Mm -hmm. We rely on co-regulation from parents, early caregivers. And that doesn't mean they need to be perfect all of the time. I think we, we, we probably are swinging a lot to my parents didn't do this, you know. So we probably just need to be mindful that most of the time or even, even some studies show half the time as long as they are connecting with us and repairing when we're upset we can, our nervous systems can be healthy. So with the co-regulation, that is like, say you're a little girl and a, you go up to pat a big dog and it knocks you over and you're really upset. So you run to your parent and they literally calm your nerves mm -hmm. and say they then take you over to pat the dog's 
in a way that's safe. You don't get knocked over. What you learn in the lower centres of your brain is that, well, lots of things there. Number one, you're going to be soothed when you're upset. You're going to, you're going to have a sense of that's that regulation coming in, healthy forming of the vagus nerve. Storing in the implicit memory, which is the system deep down, it's not like recalling a memory, but it's like knowing uh, how to do something automatically, like riding a bike. That implicit memory would get stored that dogs are okay, I can cope under stress, I know what to do, I've got resources. But let's say the same situation happened and you go to your parent and they don't give you that co-regulation, then that child needs to fall back onto either a fight or flight response to deal with it or a shutdown. Okay. And there was so many interesting studies done um, with babies that they looked at this where they didn't get that connection and they kind of just dropped into this flatness mm -hmm. and you know maybe people were saying back then oh look they are calming themselves down but it was actually going into a state of of a shutdown mm -hmm. so we know that babies and toddlers are really dependent on that co-regulation to form their own inner self-regulation later on in life mm. but in saying this we also have the potential to still change that later in life mm -hmm. so we don't want to feel helpless that we didn't but we can't influence that now but it is useful to have the awareness to see how that's influenced us for sure as we get older and particularly for people who have chronic illnesses that arise from nervous system dysregulation and things like that mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. So this, when, when an individual, when a child is going into that kind of shutdown mode, is this typically what we refer to as the fawn state where they're kind of just freezing and, and not really disconnecting in a sense? Yeah. So the fawn state has been more linked to, um, I'm not going to say it's a people pleasing response because I think that's too simple. And I think a lot of us just have that as our personality, mm -hmm. but what they've shown is that in life threatening situations with that fawn response is some people will override their own extremely strong visceral sensations and are able to be a co-regulator for somebody who may be a life, like who's life threatening. So mm -hmm. it's almost like a collapse. Yes. Yes. I'll do whatever you want. Um, but where freeze would fit in is it brings in this drop in energy. Some people in this state will faint, but it's more like a collapse. of, okay. uh, And it can feel like cutting off from the world, like I might feel fuzzy, feeling really down, and a, a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. Mm -hmm. So... That's where we're thinking like babies are calm and they're, you know, it would almost be that cutting off from um, what they're feeling. Okay. So it's, it is actually a form of psychological protection mm -hmm. for when we're really distressed. Um, and I think this is why the controlled crying method will be out soon because leaving babies to cry it out who mm -hmm. are, obviously distressed and then they will fall back onto that state last so we tend to go our first line of defense is like that fawning um, so we might negotiate with someone we might cry out for help we use our um, tools for connection then we go into fight or flight as our next line of defense and then if that doesn't work we can shut down so we see it with animals playing dead and that type of thing where people think they're just pretending, but it really is a, um, it's a collapse for psychological and, and physical protection too. Interesting. Very mm. insightful. That is, is very interesting. Do you feel that we have the ability to become addicted to our nervous system response? Is that a possibility? It's a good question. I don't think so because the process of neuroception, which is how we detect if people, places um, and environments are life-threatening, 
dangerous or safe. It's happening in the survival brain, which is low down and it's outside of our conscious awareness. So not to say that addiction is purely happening in the cognitive centers of the brain, because there's a lot of things that contribute to addiction, but we move between states, you know, like the survival brain, we move between those different states that I just explained without conscious awareness. So mm -hmm. let's say, for example, um, I'm driving along and somebody swerves onto my side of the road, I could immediately move into fight or flight and that saves my life so it's almost reflexive it's not like it got, actually goes up to the higher centers of the brain right away it stays down in the lower centers um, but what does happen is that where I spoke about implicit memory before with the girl with the dog mm -hmm. so she learned that she was safe but let's say what she would have stored in her memory without co-regulation is perhaps that dogs are unsafe and she got a phobia whenever she saw dogs when she was older, but maybe she didn't know why. Mm -hmm. So imagine sense. that, yeah, so she's walking along and she feels a heart rate go and she's like, oh, I don't want to be near it, but she might not remember it. So some, some things that happen in our life, they can be pre-verbal and we'll feel strong, strong sensations and we're not sure why. Mm -hmm. So... I would look more at, it's not addictive, but it's always adapting based on what we experience. So it's always learning. And I saw this from a physiotherapist working with people, um, say, who'd had a stroke or say, for instance, um, anything where we're retraining the body in movement, it's mm -hmm. in lower centers of the brain. Well, that's also the same with our nervous system responses, with our posture, you know, we don't sort of always think about it. It mm -hmm. just comes up. But yeah. what, in saying this as well, what we've said before is our beliefs are going to influence that too. So our stories about, um, you know, we might, we might have felt a strong visceral sense of that fight or flight energy which then creates the story of I can't trust people. Mm -hmm. So that story can stay, but it's probably being driven by a nervous system state. But we can unpack those stories and change our nervous system states. But what is most successful is bottom-up tools where we work into the body, which changes the brain um, to come into a regulation. And can you give some examples of what those bottom up tools are that people can utilize to help do this retraining? Sure. The number one thing I would suggest for people is connection with someone who is in a grounded state. Okay. So our body will, through in unconscious ways, I will be taking in your posture, your gestures, the tone of your voice and the expression on your face and I will eventually mirror that and change my internal state. So we talk so much about codependency and being able to, you know, be strong enough to do things on our own. Like we have quite an individual um, focus, but really in times of distress, it's other people being there mm -hmm. and another person who's grounded. So I didn't really understand this early on when I was a physiotherapist that me being grounded and offering that for someone to come in and be around that, that is a medicine in itself. But it's not necessarily that with co-regulation, we need to have this big story and talk about everything. It could be just going for a walk with somebody mm -hmm. or it could be cooking or it could be in some way engaging with the environment. But that would be the one thing that I would say in either that state of fight or flight or where we've moved into shutdown that will help us the most. And, you know, that's not accessible for everybody all of the time. So making the time to schedule connection, but also looking at how we might be able to bring that in more. You know, I think volunteering with something that we feel meaning behind is a really great way to do that because we connect with others, we're contributing to our community. So that's even going further and we're doing meaningful work. 
So mm -hmm. I feel that can be really helpful for people. But we can look at many factors. I don't think there is one tool that we can say is the best because it's really what's attuning to where we're at at that time. For example, if I'm a little bit nervous and a little bit wound up, I could use some breathing patterns where the inhalation matches the exhalation. But if I was in a state of panic, that could possibly just make me feel worse because I'm paying attention to a breath that feels restricted and tension in my neck and shoulders. So I think the first thing is for people to have an understanding of these responses and to start to recognize the sensations that come with it, the thoughts that come out of that, because they are building on the foundation of our nervous system and also the responses that we might have. So let's say I've been in my fight branch of my nervous system because at work it's been really stressful, there's lots of competition, and I come home and I tell my husband something really horrible and I criticise him. So we can sometimes trace it back and say, oh, yes, okay, I was in that state, wasn't I? I think that's where it really helps us the most and then we learn what our needs are in that moment so it could be I feel this build up of this mobilizing energy what I really need to do is go for a fast walk for 20 minutes get this out and then come back and spend time with my family fabulous absolutely <laughs> fabulous advice this has been so informative and educational I I am really grateful that you um, have taken the time today to really kind of go in depth and explain some of these concepts. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there around nervous system regulation, why it's happening, what kind of things that we can do. And the advice that you have provided today, I believe is very tangible advice that can guide the audience towards a better understanding. And most importantly, empowering them to understand where they can take action for themselves. So I truly appreciate it. Um, tell me where the audience can find you. Like how can people, I'm like this, this woman is amazing. I want to know more. So how can they find you? Thank you, Heather. Um, so my website is jessicamaguire.com. So there's all the information on what we have to offer as classes and programs. And then I, I'm on Instagram a lot. So my handle there is repairing the nervous system. Um, and yeah, we're on YouTube as well. You can just find that through my name. So we, we do put up a lot of resources and often have a lot of free trainings too, because it is important. Like this knowledge really is power. So yeah. I encourage everyone to, to keep learning about it. Absolutely. I, I, I'm really impressed with your approach. I think, um, of a lot of people that I've interviewed around nervous system regulation, you are a very knowledgeable individual whom approaches it from a very realistic perspective that is addressing the root. And I think that that is really phenomenal. And I, I applaud you for the work that you're doing and your commitment to the work. So do you have any kind of like group coaching? Do you work one-on-one -on -one with individuals? How can they work with you? Uh, we have our six-week program starting up March 14th. So that's a really great resource for people who want to spend the time. We do it as a, you get a new module each week, and then we have a two-hour live call. Sometimes that drops down by the end of the program, but in that time, we get to practice the tools together. You can ask questions, seek clarification, um, but that's really our best way of helping people and then Throughout the year, we also offer smaller two-hour masterclasses as well. So they'll be all on the website. Okay. I will make sure to link everything in the show notes so it makes it easy for any, anyone listening to find you. Also, I just want to say to the listeners, I think that when it comes to trying to understand and change your current nervous system regulation, that it is vital to have a knowledgeable being 
to work with. This is something that is not comfortable for us. And our subconscious is always going to take us back to our baseline state. And that can leave us feeling very defeated. So having an individual to help coach you or do a group type of program where you're tangibly using the tools together can truly be so vital at being able to overcome and shift the regulation into a more serving place. I know firsthand myself, I had so much resistance, didn't understand, fought for decades. And then once I sought appropriate individuals to help coach me through that and understand why I was experiencing and why I was having resistance, it really changed the, you know, the trajectory of, um, what, what was capable, what I was capable of achieving. So I, I highly encourage everyone to head over to Jess's website, check it out. She has free resources. You don't want to miss out on all that good stuff. Just thank you so much for being with us today. I truly appreciate your time. It's been my absolute pleasure, Heather. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Make sure you leave a review and let me know what you think. I love reading your feedback. Come hang out with me on Instagram at Heather Duranja. And don't forget to take a screenshot that you're listening to the podcast and tag me. I love to share it. See you on the next episode.